All right, guys, this is Kamran Popal again, and I'm here again with another scenario, which is an emergency scenario for the ST3 Urology National Training Interviews, and this is a post-URP bleeding scenario. So you've got an 85-year-old gentleman who's got a 95-gram prostate. He has post-URP on aspirin, atorvastatin, and bisoprolol. He stopped warfarin one week ago, and his INR is 1.1, and the catheter shows bright red uh, blood on fast irrigation. How would you assess the patient? So have a look at my uh, previous prioritization videos. I've very comprehensively discussed how I will assess a patient with post ERP bleeding. And you know, if there's clots in the catheter tubing, what will you do? So all of those check catheter patent and irrigation running, bladder wash out with 50 cc catheter tip syringe, and remove all clots from the bladder and restart irrigation at full speed. Then they ask a question. There's no, there's no improvement in hematuria and the catheter is draining, what will you do? So you will put 50 cc in the balloon, put a, a, a catheter tug either with inline traction, attaching it with the leg or with weights besides the bed, and adequate resuscitation with blood products and clotting abnormalities correction. Okay, so the bleeding continues for 40 minutes. With 40 minutes of traction, what will you do? So inform the consultant, anesthetist, theater coordinator, arrange ITU bed post-op appropriate consent or best interest form. So which consultant? So your own consultant or the operating consultant and the on-call consultant. So next question is surgical principles of DRP bleed management. So the principle, the surgical management or principles of management is endoscopic washout and careful diathermy of all bleeding points, removal of all clots using continuous flow resectoscope and ELIC evacuator, and then stopping the resectoscope irrigation um, Stopping the irrigation via the resectoscope may identify bleeding points due to low pressure and that will also help with stopping the bleeding. If everything fails, then what will you do moving on? So if available, we will consider selective angioembolization, but otherwise in an unstable patient, I will prepare for a laparotomy and prosthetic fossa backing with my consultant. Right, so last couple of questions. So what are the stages of hemorrhagic shock? You don't really need to know excessively about this, but the things that you should know about is there's four stages or four classes of shock. So class one, two, three, and four. Class one is if there's less than 750 mils of blood loss, the heart rate is normal and the blood pressure is normal. So heart rate is less than 100, blood pressure is normal. Then you've got class two, which is 750 to uh, 1,500 mils of blood loss. Your blood pressure is fine, but your heart rate goes above 100, uh, and it can be between 100 and 120. Class three shock is when you've got between 1,500 mils to 2,000 mils, so 1.5 to 2 liters of blood loss, in which your blood pressure drops and your heart rate uh, goes between 120 and 140. And four class four is greater than two liter blood loss and this the blood pressure is low and the heart rate is greater than 140 the patient's basically unstable at this point what are the types of shock so you have to be organized in this all right so you can say random sh names of shocks but it's good to say we've got cardiogenic shock obstructive shock hypovolemic shock distributive shock which includes so distributive shock then includes anaphylactic shock septic shock spinal or neurogenic shock and endocrine shock so you can also give you know different types examples as well so cardiogenic shock such as myocardial infarction obstructive shock such as massive pulmonary embolism hypovolemic shock such as dehydration or massive bleeding or hemorrhage hemorrhage or distributive shock such as anaphylactic septic spinal neuro or neurogenic and endocrine endocrine shock so this is how you classify shocks hopefully they won't ask about these but if they do you know you know the answer and it's quite straightforward that's the end of your scenario for t post urp bleeding and we'll see you in the next station which is about the turp syndrome which is also quite important and does get asked in interviews quite a lot all the best and i'll see you next time